All right, so yeah, I put together these slides for chapter five, um, Forecasters Toolbox. Feel free to stop me, discuss anything as I'm going through. Um, I kind of switched up some of the ordering relative to the chapter. I kind of wanted to follow, you know, for each of these steps, what the relevant information was across the chapter rather than like doing it it's a felt like the chapter kind of went back and forth across these steps so anyway um that's one difference with the ordering the chapter but but yeah so this chapter um was about uh you know these different steps in the process of forecasting so once you have your data um how do you arrive at like a, a reasonable model how do you arrive at a model that has good accuracy and then you kind of Okay. involves this iterative process of, um, of uh, yeah, of getting your data, um, specifying, uh, or yeah, specifying your model, estimating, evaluating, and visualizing the results and the error, um, and then doing it again, and again, and again, until you are comfortable with the model you have. And then eventually you use it to forecast, um, where you're forecasting into like unknown, time, uh, unknown future. Um, so in this chapter, uh, we'll talk about applying common forecasting techniques and evaluating accuracy, transforming and back transforming data to obtain original scales. Um, the Fable package has some really nice features to be able to do that easily. Um, yeah, and, and there's a few ways they talk about uh, uncertainty. Um, so um, they talk about kind of prediction intervals, but also distributional forecasts, um, and also different ways of generating those intervals, um, including bootstrapping. And then they also talk about visualizing residuals. Um, all right, any questions so far or comments? All right. So what I actually tried to do throughout this, this, this notes is I tried to do it in both fable and uh, uh, like model time um, and time TK so that I was just curious how each, you know, you do it in each. Um, and uh, I, I know that some of, like, some of you have talked about model time, so um, I think you're probably familiar with it, um, but basically it's a tidy models forecasting um, library. So, um, so yeah, so generally when you're preparing, you're on this preparation step. So we're starting uh, like kind of here in the tidying, preparing area. Um, you're going to transform your predictors and your outcome um, if needed, uh, impute missing values, um, plot your time series to get a feel for trends and seasonality and things like that. And then once you're ready to start, um, estimating models, uh, you want to split your data into train and test sets. So like this is the same idea as you know any other non-time series approach, except there are some uh, special variations of how you do that splitting uh, for time series. And we'll talk about that. Um, so in Fable, you know, this splitting uh, uh, part uh, that you do, you know, if you want to build a train set, and we're working with this Australia production data, which is available in the, I think the Fable or TS, I think uh, is it the fable or it might be this one, TS table uh, data. Um, so in this case, this is what they did in the book. Um, basically, just taking the beginning of the time series up until uh, 2006 quarter four as the train set, and then everything else after that uh, would be the the test. I think it goes until 2010 if I remember correctly. Um, if we're doing this in time TK. Um, in our sample, uh, it's slightly different. So I, at least how I did it, it requires a little bit more code, but I, I actually prefer for this. Um, so basically, um, uh, first thing I did, so I think the data actually starts earlier than 1992. Um, so I just filtered everything to make sure it was after 1992 quarter or you know January 1st. Um, made into a tibble um, and got rid of this uh, quarter time. Uh, so I made this new date variable as date uh, quarter uh, so that it would work with this. And then uh, 
this is i think from time tk um or time tk extension of our sample basically you can do a time series split um so what you're doing here is you have an initial period um where you're using as your train set and then you have assessment periods where it uses your test uh which comes after the initial period one second and tell the kids to calm down you guys guys sorry um and then you just extract so like tidy models you just extract you know um from the split object the train set which will be this initial period and the test set just the um period after that the four years um yeah any questions about that comments yeah uh, just a comment kevin uh, uh that's great that you are bringing the you know the tidy models uh version okay because uh you know i, I haven't I, i'm doing chapter right now because i'm the one presenting it and one other thing is that when you are trying to you know apply different models uh to see which is the one that best fits you know a different time series uh temp tk and model time are engineer uh for multiple uh time series okay and multiple models in other words it, it makes it easier i don't know you know how the author is going to present that but i don't you know i i, I wouldn't venture too far that it's going to be a little more complicated you know in the long run right uh because right now for example in in this phase of you know splitting the the data set to training and, and and testing i mean it's it's pretty obvious right you know the the the, the original code is, is simpler right it's simpler you know and easy to understand you know you just take the chunk of days that you have for training and then the other one for testing you know uh, you can you can do the set diff right you know to to do that but uh you know it takes a little more code but eventually you will see that if we continue to use study models it will make it easier okay to apply different models and uh you know uh get get you know get get different uh you know different metrics okay uh if you have multiple time series for example some time series will perform better with one one model with one algorithm than others etc so eventually in the long run it would i i think it would uh uh you know uh, uh save time you know in the in the in the process of you know the whole circle of uh, evaluating specifying all that and then you know the forecasting which is the you know the main goal yeah yeah, I agree. I, I just like how it's consistent with the API of tidy models and, you know, like you don't have to learn, like if you know, understand that workflow, this fits right in, you know, and Fable is very different than that. Um, Correct. I mean, I think like the extra effort here, the multi few lines, it was mostly just because Fable works like natively with like quarter time right. objects um, and because it's like kind of trying to be geared towards uh i guess like context where you where you're dealing with quarterly dates um mm -hmm. quarterly yes. date objects but i guess for one i don't see any reason why they couldn't add that as like a extension for um time tk and our sample but um also it's not that much more i don't know it's it's not it's not too uh, right too bad uh, yeah let me let, let, let me tell you, you know for time series i prefer to uh work with the you know in r with the tidy models uh because it's consistent okay it's consistent you know you can do your recipes and not have that data leakage you know problem between the training and the testing set so you know it's it's very well thought uh the tidy models you know to try not to you know not to make uh errors uh on four servers <laughs> yeah i think the leakage thing is something i was talking about this in uh the islr book um, yeah we there was a tweet a few weeks ago where they were showing um a bunch of um like ml papers in different fields and someone reviewed mm -hmm. all of them and was looking for the common like errors in them and and the one that kept on appearing was um 
was leakage from the trains right. in the test set. So they were using some kind of estimation on the, on the full data that they used to train when Correct. it was, but actually they're, you know, it was leaking into the test set. So I think, I agree. I think they, you know, yep. I like the, how it's opinionated in terms of good statistical practice and Correct. yeah, that's why I wanted to do it. And I just wanted to get a feel for, you know, what the different, um, I've used good, it a good. little bit at work, but, um, yeah, mm -hmm. and, uh, the different, you know, how these two approaches compare. Um, but yeah, so let me go. I'll, it's okay. If it's okay. I want to, uh, move ahead to the next, uh, slide here. Um, what as what you said that actually is a good transition is um so from from here on until we choose our final model so if we go back to this diagram we're going to be in the next few slides in this cycle um as you said uh oops, we're going to be working just with this train data here so um you know like in that process you you're not going to touch this at all um so until you want to finally evaluate it so um so yeah, so this was uh, so at this point, right? You've 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 cleaned up your data. You've um, done whatever feature engineering you want. Uh, we talked about features in the last chapter, so I didn't go as much into that. Um, but you maybe you have you know a lot of cases you have a few candidate models that you want to use and you want to compare. Um, you know, maybe you have a favorite model you think it's going to do really well, but you want to have a baseline as well. So a lot of the time, these like mean or naive or seasonal naive models um, are used according to Rob Hyman as those baselines. Um, they're usually not the model you wanna choose for forecasting, but they're decent at just giving you, you know, like the, uh, the very, the very, yeah, very naive approach, I guess, the, the approach that doesn't use a lot of information about trend and seasonality. It's just really about the kind of either the mean or the most recent um, data point in uh, a season. Um, so I so this is what they did in the book for for this process. So for fitting, um, you know, a few of these models. And the nice thing about this, and also in, in tidy mo uh, tidy, uh, sorry, in model time, is that uh, you can fit all these at once, right? So you can fit this mean model, this naive model, the seasonal naive model. In this way, just in this one model object, it's taking in the train set here. So it's the set from 1992 to 2006, quarter four. Um, okay. And I think in the book, they use a different data set here. I'm using the beer data set um, that he has in his package. Okay, so then I'm doing something similar here in model time. Um, I didn't put in the mean model, but I did put in the naive and seasonal naive. So the nice thing here is that naive and seasonal naive um, are the same kind of syntax. The only thing that changes is what engine we use. So with um, with seasonal naive, it's just S naive. And with naive, it's just naive. Um, and uh, DS was that date object that I created uh, that um, off of that quarter, what, what was originally in, as a just a quarter date object. Um, so I'm using DS. Um, and predicting beer, uh, I think it's sales. Um, and, and again, using this train set. So, so I'm just using this right here, okay? Um, and then in model time, you can do something similar to what we did up here. You can kind of uh, estimate them all at once using this model time table function. Okay, so um, once you've trained it, you fit on the train set, um, you can forecast. Um, in this case, he's actually bringing back in the full data set so you can see kind of how your predictions line up with your forecast. Um, I'll show, I think on the next one, that there's some other options for doing this where you don't, you don't have to like peek at your data if you're still trying to you know, decide on what your best uh, model is gonna be. But, um, but yeah, so uh, basically in, in Fable, you just take your fitted object and forecast. H is like the number of, uh, it's the horizon, the number of time points into the future uh, you want to forecast. Uh, so I think since this is quarters, it's 14 quarters. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you have, uh, he has these nice auto plot functions. And then basically he's just bringing back in the production data that was after the point 
in which he created that train set. So the train set went until 2006 quarter four, and then he's taking this, uh, you know, the rest of the data, filtering it for everything starting in 2007 quarter one, and then layering them on top of each other. So you can see how the forecasts do in comparison to the, uh, you know, the, the, the observed trend. Um, yeah, and so just like the other stuff, I wanted to see what this looked like in model time. Um, so you just have your model tibble, um, your, uh, yeah, calibrating uh, to this train testing data. So I guess I lied, <laughs> this, this section does have test data in it, which uh, again, if you're still trying to figure out what your final model is, it's probably not a best practice. Um, and then, uh, and then once you calibrate it uh, to the test data, so I guess this is like refitting it based on the test data. Um, and then, and then you say, okay, like I'm going to forecast based on my new data. This is my uh, actual data, like my observed uh, outcomes. And then, and then they have a convenience function to plot it. One thing I noticed that I don't quite understand, I haven't spent a lot of time digging into this is that the um, these, uh, the naive forecasts ended up in a different place than in the fable version. So in fable, like naive is, is actually forecasting a little bit higher, um, than, than, uh, the observed values. Um, and then in, it might just be because of, you know what that is? I think it's because I didn't quite align the the, the data in terms of time. So it might just be because the last observed point here was uh, the, in the train set was kind of a minimum. And then it just followed that for the rest of the series. Uh, whereas the last one in this set was, a, was kind of at the peak. So it just followed that. I think that's what happened, but they should be doing the same thing. Um, but, but yeah, um, any questions or comments about this? Um. Um, well, just a naive question, I guess. So mm -hmm. regarding the, so if we want to do exploratory data analysis, should we do it only on the training set or can we do it on the whole data? Or because, well, I guess in practice, I usually just um, explore the whole data. And then when I'm doing the modeling stuff, Mm -hmm. Then eventually I split uh, the data to training and test. Or so mm -hmm. should we do that from really early on once we get the data, or how yeah. should you do that? It's a good. I mean, it's a good question. I think people have different opinions on this. Um, I think it's natural to be able to like. I think visualizing is probably okay early on. Um, just looking at the full time series, trying to get a sense for the seasonality and things like that. Um, but I think if you do any sort of evaluation and estimation where you're like estimating on the train set, evaluating on the, on the full test set, like the holdout, and then you're doing something else and, and doing a different model based on that. Um, I think you run the risk of overfitting, but that's just my opinion. Like, um, like uh, here I have uh, the next section, I have some uh, the, the stuff with cross validation, um, with time series that I think, is at least part of my answer to that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, it, I don't know what you all think or how you all would handle that other than what I just said. But I, I think it is a little risky if like, if, if you're continually, if you're still kind of in this loop, but you're, you're evaluating a model against the, um, your holdout set, and then you go back into this loop and start doing it again. Um, it's not like really realistic in terms of what your error is going to be like going into the future if you're peaking at your holdout. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, uh, this is my thoughts about it. I haven't. It's a really good question. I think that's something I struggle with going through. This is like mm -hmm. where I landed on that. Um, but yeah, what do you all think? I, I, I just want to add on the question because it's a, you know, it's a very valid and usually have to have to be aware of when you're going to do the, you know, the splitting to avoid the, that data leakage, right? And for example, uh, you know, the, the, because the, the, the goal is to create a model that generalizes, right? So when new data comes, okay, when new data comes, 
you you make the whole process okay of transforming that data set but it's with that information okay it's not with your train model because your train model was optimized okay for a specific uh data set right so the the goal is to when you split that data set into the train and testing you hold out you know you hold out that testing set you know you don't you, you don't contaminate in other words, not contaminated with what's happening in the training set. So when the model is applied to the testing set, you can see if it is a good fit or not. Okay. If you, you know, contaminate that testing set, for example, uh, calculating a mean on the whole data set to impute uh, missing missing variables. Okay. The, the mean of all the data sets. You risk then that the information that it came from the training set is leaking on the on the on the testing set and then you can get an overestimation of your of, of your model which is not real because then when new data comes you're not using you know the parameter of the training set you'll see the parameters of the same data and now your model uh, struggles okay so yeah uh, usually i have seen the practice of you know doing the the this exploratory uh, data analysis in the whole data set, you know, to get an idea of that, but then you start anew, okay? You go to the data set as, as it was, you know, uh, in, in the raw format and then do the splitting, okay? And then do all those transformations, uh, imputing, et cetera. So you don't, you know, contaminate one side with the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a, a quick um, addition, uh, uh, as well as uh, have some doubts uh, on this uh, concern. So basically, uh, when I do the splitting, I usually do very early on. So as soon as I get the data, I do a, a bit of uh, exploratory analysis and then I split the data. Then if I use study model and I do like the, the and I set up a recipe, um a receipt so this receipt uh will contain some some steps and if i use some particular steps which are very impacting the data so they change like the structure of the data such as a step down sample uh, for example if i do maybe th this is not the case for um uh, but but let, let's make this case. I mean, if I use the, some steps which are very making uh, the data uh, transform mm, different, mm, so that they may be uh, something that will impact my uh, my prediction. So, and, and this is the case when I do uh, cross validation, for example. So, if I do cross validation, cross validation on. Uh, the data that are, uh, that are already uh, modified in my uh, recipe. Because if I do cross validation on the split, so on early data before the uh, the steps, the, 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 uh, uh, the data are not affected from, from these uh, um, important uh, changes that I've made in the data. So now um, you are not you haven't talked about uh, cross validation. So um, you talk yeah, about the, the, the next yeah. slide actually. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the, my, my question is, why if I do the split, uh, why why I should? Um, uh, so basically, it, it depends by if I do the wrangling before. Uh, so I want to use the steps. If I do that wrangling and then make the split, that means that when I do the the, the recipe, I won't make any steps which are very uh, impacting or changing the data too much. Okay, so um, why I should. Uh, so I, I usually split the data and then make the recipe on the training set. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what, consistent with what I uh, would do. And I think it's what I would say the tiny models workflow 
encourages. I think it's pretty clear to me that if you're if you're estimating some kind of a value based on data uh, to inform your model, you definitely want to do that only on the train set. Um, but I think I don't know. At least my understanding of like Mikal, your question and where we we're going with that conversation is like also more of like the informal side of it. Like once you've estimated and you've trained on the full train set and you forecast on this test set that you held out and then you say oh wow like the tech there's actually you know now a exponential or a multiplicative seasonality going on after this and you go back and you estimate a new model that has multiplicative seasonality because you know the test part is going to have that then i think you're not being uh genuine with like what your future predictions, how strong your future predictions are going to be, you know? So like, I think in that case, you haven't really contaminated anything, but you've contaminated your analysis approach, you know, like, and I think like you haven't contaminated anything you've estimated. You just said, oh, wow. Like I actually know the future in this case. I'm going to change how I'm training based on that. I don't know. I think, I think that could be problematic. Um, yeah. But but totally agree with what you're saying. Um, yeah, it, it, that, that that would be like a that leakage, but to the to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, from the testing to the training, and that also you yeah. know is not supposed to happen. Okay, right. so uh, usually what what you do is that you know uh, let, let's say that you have you know your model right, and there's some new data coming right, and then you kind of uh, see that the pattern has changed. Okay, maybe the seasonality or something. Uh, to have, maybe to avoid what I have seen in the project, to avoid that data leakage, you know, to try to then accommodate your training uh, model, which is fine, okay? It's with the data that you had, you know, at that time. It's, it's more like a model drift, you know, approach, right? In the model drift, then you get new data, you develop a new training model, you, 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 uh, create create that new model and then you apply it to unforeseen data, okay? Because remember, uh, let, let's say that you had a model working fine before the pandemic, okay? And then the pandemic occurs and everything is blown out, out of the window, right? Seasonality changes, you know, there's a lot of uh, like the air passengers uh, uh, data set, remember? That there was a period that there was no, uh, you know, no activity. Okay, so what happens? You have to think, okay, my model was working so far, but then in the future, if that pattern persists, then I have to retrain my model, okay? I have to retrain my model to accept those new factors that I didn't account in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the previous models. And for me, that's more like a model drift, uh, you know, uh, 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 diagnosis, than trying to accommodate, right? You know, accommodate, okay, I know now in the future that it is going to be multiplicative, additive, and now I'm going to change that. Uh, you know, that would be a little bit tricky <laughs> to explain, right? Yeah, I mean, if the characteristics of the data like change and you're, you know, like, you know, and like definitely, I think it's totally fine to try to make a better model and to accommodate some kind of, fundamental change in the data how the data is being generated but yeah i don't know like one more thought on this before i go on to cross validation is that um is that i think with time series it's almost like a more special case of that kind of casual leakage we were just talking about because in the other case where you have tabular data where there isn't this time dependency like you can construct you construct your train and test sets uh, based on some random 80-20 split or whatever the, the percentages you want to choose. In this case, your holdout is almost is always going to be into the future, right? It's always going to be kind of the same data. Um, so I think even to me, at least, it's like more of a consequence if you look at that data because then you don't have anything else to go to. You can't, you can't re-estimate, do a split again with your new approach and then try it with the held out set again, because that held out set's gonna be the same or about the same, you know? Cause it's always gonna be that last period that you held out, you know? Maybe it could be a little longer, a little shorter, but it's still gonna be the same time period. So, um, so I think because of that time dependency, it might even be more important to have, you know, not look at that test set until you're really sure that you have a final model. 
but um, um, sorry for the noise in the background. There's some kids who want to go to the beach. Um, all right. Uh, I don't know if it sounds loud to you guys, but um, it's very loud to me. Um, all right. All right, let's move on to this next phase. So I think um, uh, I'll talk about down here um, uh, evaluating model performance, but we'll talk about cross-validation because I think it addresses the need of seeing a lot of different train test splits without actually going into that test set at all. Um, um, so, but before we talk about that, we'll just talk about um, residuals. So, Basically, as we all, I think we all know, um, residuals are what's left over after the model is given predictions for each observation. In Fable, they have what's called innovation residuals. So these are provided as another column. Um, if you choose, I think in, it might just be there at all model output, or I, I think maybe in some cases you might have to specify like type residuals innovation or something like that. I have to look back at the book. But, um, but in this case, Right, if you just call augment on beer fit, um, you, uh, which is the fitted data, uh, fitted model, um, you get uh, for each model, so we fit it to like three different models, you get for each point um, that you had in that, that train set, the fitted value, the residual, and then the innovation residual. Um, and in my opinion, innovation is a little, it's kind of a weird word for, for these residuals, but it's basically the um, back transformed um, residual. So like if you had, so in this case, they're exactly the same, but if you had log transformed your outcome, these would actually be, go back to the original scale, um, uh, residuals on the original scale. So that's really nice. That can be a really annoying thing to have to figure out yourself, uh, figure out how to do that. So I think that's a pretty interesting um, feature. Uh, and I actually, I, you know, I want to look a little bit at how Tidy Models handles that. I'm not entirely sure. I think there might be some ways of doing that easily. But, um, uh, but yeah, so I think that's pretty interesting, although I'm skeptical of the name. But I guess maybe Rob Hyman had a better reason that I can't think of um, for naming it that way. And then, uh, and then if you're looking at this calibration table object in model time, you can actually pull out the uh, residuals in the same way. Oh, I, I guess I pulled out the calibrated data after it was calibrated for the test data. So this is going to be the test data set, no, but it's okay. Um, uh, you, you get the same idea. Um, so you can just pull out uh, this calibration data and get the first object here. Um, which I think is probably the first model that we fit. And then you get the actual the prediction, the residuals for that. Um, and uh, you can do all kinds of uh, things with the residuals to see you know, if your um, model is doing a good job. Um, let me actually hop over to this quickly um, to show you. So basically a good forecasting method has a few properties for their residuals, um, but they're uncorrelated. Um, so especially in time. Uh, so if you look at an autocorrelation plot and you look at you know, uh, how correlated are, are residuals that are um, two periods, four periods, six periods, eight periods apart in time, um, you shouldn't really see um, you know, a whole lot of significant autocorrelation. Otherwise, your, your model is not picking up on some sort of seasonality that it should be. And um, also zero mean. Um, so if it doesn't have a zero mean, it's like shifted to the right or left, then you, it's biased, right? So it's like consistently a little bit higher, a little bit lower than it should be. Um, and in some cases you can correct for that by just adding, subtracting, whatever that bias is. But, um, but yeah, but that's another issue. And then uh, constant variance is another one. So um, across, uh, you know, your residuals, like if you look at it across time, it should be a similar amount of variance across time. Um, and then uh, normal distribution. And he says the last two are nice to have but not essential. So he really focuses on being un the residuals being uncorrelated and have zero mean. Um, and there's this really nice, so this is something I didn't see in all time, but maybe I missed it or I don't, you know, I'm not an expert on it. But um, basically if you feed in the model, 
uh, with the train data. Um, you can use this convenience function called gg underscore ts residuals for time series residuals. And it gives you three plots um, by default the innovation residuals over time. So you can kind of look at the variance, the um, uh, autocorrelation plot, as well as just the distribution and histograms. So you can see how they're distributed with the, what the mean looks like, um, things like that. So yeah, and he also mentions uh, autocorrelation can be formally assessed using the Box Pierce or Lejeune box test um, with the Lejeune box test being more accurate um, or the more preferred method. Um, and then basically these tests are trying to determine whether or not the time series is significantly different than a white noise process, the, the one that's like left over. Um, and if it isn't significantly different than white noise, then your model has done a pretty good job because you removed all of the trends and seasonality and you know done a good job capturing the, the, those features in the data. Um, any questions about this before I go back to the cross validation? Comments? Uh, yeah, uh, Kevin, just a comment. Uh, I'm going to post that uh, that question on the on the business science Slack. Okay, because uh, Matt is the one that created this uh, package, uh, model time, Matt Danko. And probably he has an answer in terms of the residuals and the innovation residuals. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. so I'll try to, uh, you know, to do to, to post it in the in, in, in his lag, you know, channel and see what's the response. Cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, thanks. Yeah. And then the this, I mean, you can create this just by, you know, ggplot and, you know, just knowing, just being, you know, you can do these three things. Uh, there's an autocorrelation function you can use, but this is really nice right. to have this. So it'd be interesting if, if he also had an answer for that too. Um, yeah, Pro you know, probably. Kind of model diagnostics plot. I think there was something, but. Um, Probably, uh, if 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 it's not you know in the in the package, you know that wrapper that wrapper function, probably he say you know uh, issue issue a ticket, you know mm -hmm. I will take care of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just oh, one second. Let me just go. Uh, Flip side bar here. Just trying to let um no use there's a reference. Some I think for evaluation. Okay, so they have these metric sets, but these are kind of like summarized uh, extended forecasting. So we'd have to look at these and just see what some of these output. Um, but it seems like they're just kind of like static uh, summaries. Um, wonder if there's a one that you can extract the residuals and kind of do what's being done in Fable. Uh, see, I don't see it here, but. Um, but it wouldn't be too hard to add. So anyway, all right. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what he says. Um, okay, let's go back here. Um, so, so basically, like we said before, um, cross validation is a really important you, toolkit tool for any uh, modeling process because you're able to simulate that sampling and resampling, um, but you stay within your train set and you're able to evaluate many different models with many different um, kind of parameter configurations um, to find the best hyperparameters that, that result in the best forecast on the, on the test set. Um, however, in the time series context, val cross-validation has to be constructed in a slightly different way. It can't just be random indexes or random observations because you have this dependency on time. So if you use something from the future to train something that you're going to be used to forecast the future, uh, obviously you're, you're kind of cheating a little bit. Um, so uh, one way of doing this with time series data or a common way is to um, split your train set into many folds. So if you can imagine, you know, we just took our, uh, our train data. Um, well, I don't have it here, but um, oh yeah, I have it down here. Um, your train data, um, and you're saying within that train set, I'm going to split this into many folds so that uh, I can, you know, evaluate across, um, you know, a bunch of different train test samples and get a sense for, you know, how accuracy varies across across many samples. Um, 
And yeah, and so and so one way of doing this is to kind of uh, iteratively add uh, a point to your train set for each fold. So you can start with like five points in this six points here, then that next point, you know, you forecast one ahead and that'll be your one ahead forecast. And then you, you have another set, another fold with six points and you do one ahead of that. And you keep on doing that and then you'll have however many this is, um, hold that set. Um, but it doesn't have to be just one point. So you can also do it so that there's, you're assessing on two months or three months ahead, ahead of this uh, data here. Um, but I guess the nice thing about this one point ahead forecast is that you can have many folds, um, you know, for, for as many data points as you have minus whatever this initial is, you'll have that many folds. So it gives you a lot of samples to work with, I guess, um, if you do it this way. Um, and I really like this visualization. I think it makes it really clear. So like you're always obviously evaluating on one step ahead um, and you're, you're building up this train set over time. I've also seen it where uh, like you're, you use a, this, a constant initial uh, train set. So the train isn't growing, but it's moving to the right. I've also seen that too. Um, but I think, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Um, so in Fable, uh, you can use this function called stretch to, to Sybil, to, I, I'm not going to say that right. I keep on forgetting how people say it. But basically, you have uh, initial period, which is in this case is uh, four. Well, in this graphic, I think it's six. Um, and then you're forecasting one step ahead. Or uh, this might actually might mean that this, uh, I think this actually refers to, uh, I could be wrong about this, but I think this refers to when you get the next fold, how far ahead are you going? How far? You know, are you skipping a bunch of data and doing another train test split further ahead? Or are you going just one step up doing a new train test split? Um, but I have to, I have to look at that to make sure that's right. Um, yeah. And then, so you, in, in, um, in Fable, what this gives you is just a bunch of, um, folds, uh, each with a different ID. Um, so you have ID one, 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 these are all part of the same set. Um, and yeah, um, and so if you're working with Fable, you can use this object to then fit uh, on every fold and, and get some kind of measure of accuracy across all those fits and tests. In model time, there's this time series CV function. So again, you're working with your train data. You can say what your initial is. So that's gonna be this like initial, like how much are you starting with in your train set? So I just said, in this case, one year, I'm gonna assess uh, one period ahead. And then this cumulative um, uh, argument is, is gonna give you what you have right here. So it's cumulative in the sense that the train set is building up over time, um, but you don't have to have it like that. And you can just set, like I said, move to the right without actually uh, taking uh, every uh, historical point uh, before your, your train starts. So you can just kind of have the same amount of training data and just keep moving to the right, um, which would not be cumulative. But in this case, in this graphic, that's cumulative. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, and then this gives you the actual data so you can take a look at it. So you have uh, these divided up into slices. Um, uh, so I think these slices refer to the folds and then it tells you if it's a training or evaluation. Um, so these are all training. And then in slice one, after all these training periods, you'll have that this should be, uh, it's weird. It says it's, I, I did say it was one year for initial. Oh, it is cumulative, I see. So this might be the, the fully accumulated fold like at the bottom here. I'm not really sure, but anyway, so this gives you all your, all your sets you can work with, all your folds. And then, um, if you have a bunch of hyper parameters or anything you want to tune in your models, you would use a cross-validated, you know, um, set like this to, to conduct that tuning before you then predict with your final model and then pull that set. Okay. Any comments, questions? I know that was kind of a lot and I guess I jumped from one side to the other, but, um, yeah. What do you think? 
I really like these graphics. I think they make it really clear kind of what you're doing um, with, with, I mean, your, with your folks. It, it will yeah. be interesting. It will be interesting to see what is the effect of, uh, you know, the training, the cross-validation uh, data set, take cumulative as true and comparing it with the cumulative as false, okay? Because, you know, in the cumulative true, you are taking, you know, each time is growing, right? You know, your, 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 your validation, uh, you know, the cross-validation false, right? Uh, but in the other one, it stays fixed. So it's just the same number. So I wonder, you know, what is the, you know, in, 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 the, in the modeling phase, what is the effect, you know, it, you know if, if, if one is uh, better in the, in, in the training models, if one is better than the other one? Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, a good, yeah, it's a, that's a question, it's a, that's a question. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think part of it, at least in my mind, is that they give you slightly different insights. Like the cumulative one can tell you how much a model improves as it gets more data like for one right so like each fold you're getting more and more train data so it's like able to use more information in this case in the cumulative case and you can look across the folds and say with like with like uh you know a year of initial versus a year and a half versus two years like like you could say you know it could tell you like how much training data should i have in the future if i'm going to use this model in order to train it with reasonable accuracy um, while not including stuff that's not going to help it, you know? So I guess that's one way of looking at it. Um, but if you're just purely concerned with accuracy, um, on that whole dot set, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I have to think about that. Like, um, I guess you could always, you could do both procedures, you know, and, um, you know, like do it, have a, take a bunch of data sets and see which one performs the best but like intuitively i don't know um yeah uh, right now it's, it's not clear you know which one you know would give you the better result you know it, it, you have to experiment you know with that yeah <laughs> that i think <laughs> i think it is a little bit weird in like model training in general if like your your train sets are of like different sizes um <laughs> right because, right <laughs> because like uh i don't know like if you know yeah. that you're gonna at least have two years of data, right? And you can have make that initial data set two years and still have a decent amount, like if you have a decent amount of historical record, um, then uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a function of how much historical data you have. Cause like, if you have a ton of historical data, I don't see why you'd use a cumulative approach because then right. you would still be able to generate a decent number of, of folds without, um, without having to do this like cumulative approach with like one ahead. Um, yep. I don't know, I maybe, I don't know if that makes sense, but maybe it's something a function of how much data you have. Um, mm -hmm. Like does the cumulative approach actually give you more folds? Maybe not actually, I don't know. I don't know, it's a really good question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But I think it just feels weird to me that like each train set is not the same size. Um, so like if you were to use like um, some aggregate measure like mean squared error, right? And like you're looking like if that error could be not consistent across train sets of different sizes, right? So like your mean squared error could be huge when you have six data points, but after you get 10, it's like very small. And if you're gonna be using at least 10 data points in your forecasting and training into the future, then like, why is having six points even relevant, you know? Um, and if everything, if performance is very similar after that threshold, then why does it matter if you add more points if it's not gonna improve your forecast? Like in that case, I almost would wanna make it not cumulative and then, and then have the same train set and just evaluate like each parameter combination using the same kind of uh, size of your data. Um, uh, I, I, I guess I've always felt that cumulative is a little bit weird, but, um, but also I don't even, I would have to look at these functions here, maybe stretch to Sybil 
gives you an option, but um, it seems like the default might be cumulative for Fable. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Any other thoughts on that? So even though the training set have different sizes, but the validation set, set always have the size of one, right? So when and you aggregate yeah. the yeah. metric, then it doesn't really affect um, how it mm -hmm. is, how it is calculated. Right. Yeah, like it'll be calculated in the same way in the sense of like your your validation set's gonna be the same size, but the but what I was saying is like your your model may be, it behave very differently if it has five data points versus 50. And maybe after like 10 data points, everything after that has similar, you know, um uh like ability to forecast and like you know, I don't know, that's all I was saying. Um yeah, that's that, true. Because different models may have different characteristic given mm -hmm. the amount of data, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it may mess up your evaluation. I right. See. Like, like if, like if everything after ten data points or more in your train set has amazing accuracy, but everything below that is like totally useless, then if you look at an average across twenty folds, then then you're gonna you might miss that, right? Um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess it's maybe important also in that case to look at the distribution of, of that accuracy metric across all your folds and not just the aggregate. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, all right. Um, maybe I'll go on to the next, uh, I don't I probably won't get through all of it, but I only have five minutes left, but I'll try on this section. Um, okay, um, so when so when you do these forecasting methods, so like when we saw, when we looked at residuals, um, we saw a point estimate, right? So like a forecast, like an individual point, but a lot of the time, especially with forecasting, like for business or anything really, you care a lot about the uncertainty of the forecast. So you wanna know how much, um, you know, variation will there be likely around this uh, point estimate um, and what is the distribution of possible kind of future values around this, this, this estimate that you're making for the forecast. Um, and uh, we can represent this uncertainty as confidence intervals or as prediction intervals. Um, and so one thing that Rob Hyman points out is that for mean, naive, seasonal naive, and drift models, prediction intervals can be computed directly from the residual standard deviation, assuming uncorrelated residuals. So this is um, the uh, standard deviation based on um, a certain number of steps you're going into, into the future. So some of these actually don't even have the H in here. So I guess it's a constant for mean, it's a constant, um, uh, maybe seasonal naive as well. It's a constant kind of standard deviation, um, uh, uh, you know, no matter how far ahead you're forecasting, but for naive, right, it's like uh, the variance times, I guess, yeah, I think it's the variance times the square root of your horizon or how far you're, you're going ahead. Um, let's see, K is the integer part of, sorry, I need to, <laughs> haven't looked at this in a week. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's the residual standard deviation. M is the seasonal period and K is the integer part of H minus one over M. So this H is the, how far ahead you're forecasting. And M, uh, not really sure what M is. Might be the seasonal period. Anyway, the point here is that you can exactly calculate the, uh, the um, standard deviation and build a uh, confidence or sorry, prediction intervals around any kind of point estimate if you're using one of these models. These are like kind of baseline models. So uh, you're probably not going to use it very much for forecasting, but they are really nice properties of this that you can calculate directly from here, um, from your residual uh, standard deviation. Um, yeah, assuming that they're un the residuals are uncorrelated. Um, but one important thing is that you can't always make 
these assumptions, like uncorrelated residuals. Um, and uh, another approach to doing this, to making prediction intervals with bootstrapping. Um, so uh, the approach that he described, and I tried to, I did actually a lot of research to try to make sure I was describing this properly. And I think what I've had here is right, but please correct me if you have a different understanding of this. So basically, if you wanted to do a bootstrapped prediction interval estimate, um, you would uh, first fit your model to a certain portion of the data. Um, and then, uh, or sorry, this is if you're, yeah. So if you want some kind of prediction interval into the future for your forecast, you fit a model to uh, your data, and then you draw one sample from the past residuals. So you look at all the past residuals of your observed values, you draw one sample from that, you forecast one step ahead. So whatever your um, next step is, and then you add in that residual sample that you've sampled from the past set of residuals. Um, and then you uh, re kind of configure uh, your model uh, to um, include this next point. And then you do this another one step forecast um, and you just kind of repeat over and over again. And you can do this for, you know, let's say 10, 10 points into the future, but then repeat this, this procedure a thousand times. And then that gives you a distribution of, uh, of predictions for each point and each horizon into the future. Um, so in your bootstrapping, because you're, you're sampling from your past residuals, right? Um, and to create new data. Um, so that's the general process. Um, and uh, this, the Fable has a really nice function called generate um, that, that does this for you. So you don't even have to know uh, what all these steps are. You just take your fitted function um, so you have this fitted model already. You say whatever horizon you want to have. Um, how many samples do you want to create? How many kind of possible future um, forecasts do you want to create? And if you just set this bootstrap option to true, it'll bootstrap five new kind of forecasted time series um, 30 steps into the future. Uh, so if you do that here with this uh, Australia production um, data, this is kind of what all those different possible futures are. Um, and so if you did this, let's say a thousand times, you could look at uh, directly at each point, the fifth and 95th um, percentiles for those, for, for each point, right? Across all those kind of simulated bootstrapped samples. And then you get a prediction interval um, out of that. And the nice thing is you're not making really as many assumptions about um, you're the really the main assumption here is that the residuals in the past are going to look a lot like the residuals in the future that they're not like um, that they're normally distributed and that they're they're not going to change in their kind of shape uh, going to the future. Uh, but I think it's quite a cool bootstrapping is always really interesting to me because it's it's very intuitive kind of like how you get these intervals right you're not like using like uh, um, a formula like this, where you have to think a bit about where it comes from. Like you're, you're just using your own data and the residuals that are generated in the past to create new, new data points that, um, you know, um, yeah, that you, might, that you might see if you chose a slightly different sample and then you, yeah, and you get these intervals, you know, without having to make a ton of assumptions about, um, about what, uh, what, what uh, the data looks like and what the data generating process is like. But I, I really love this, uh, this part. Um, I linked in this blog post from Rob Hyman where he talks about it a little more. And I actually found that the chapter 12 neural net discussion um, has a much better explanation of this bootstrapping procedure here. Um, so I encourage you to check it out if, uh, if you're interested. Um, Okay, we're at 302. I just have one more slide here and then we can talk about whatever you want. Um, I probably have a few more minutes. I didn't put in a ton here because I kind of ran out of time, but um, basically um, when we evaluate forecast accuracy, we can think about it as evaluating point forecasts or actually evaluating the distribution of those forecasts. Uh, there's different methods for both. Um, 
Some common methods for evaluating point forecasts are uh, scale dependent errors, so root mean squared error, mean absolute error, um, percentage errors, or scaled errors. Um, and then with distributional forecasts, you can do things like quantile scores, Winkler scores, continuous rank probability scores, or skill scores. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my notes. Um, any other, any questions, comments, anything that stood out that you want to talk more about? Um, I have a few minutes. I'm always fascinated by bootstrapping and like, it's really interesting when you're doing it in a time series setting. Um, yeah, and I think it's really cool because like you can even use it for like a neural net in this case, um, uh, you know, and generate those prediction intervals where it doesn't really quote unquote come with the method you're using. Um, um, one, one guy that really likes, uh, you know, simulation and bootstrapping is uh, David Robinson. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of him. <laughs> Yeah, I watch his uh, Tidy Tuesday videos a little bit. Oh, right. I, I used yeah, to watch he, yeah. he have the weekly, uh, you know, YouTube uh, uh, wrangling there. And yeah, he has a lot in, a, he has a blog called Variance Explained, and he uses it because he prefers the bootstrapping method than the mathematical method. And it's because, you know, you use, you, you use the, the data that you are trying to, you know, to extract the, the statistic, okay? And because now computers, you know, can do, you know, so many things, uh, you know, doing simulations in, in, in a computer is not that, that you know, that, that time consuming anymore, okay? Because of the power, you know, the power that we have now. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I'm going to, uh, maybe we can discuss uh, next, the session, next section, some of the exercises. I'm intrigued about the, the, the cross-validation plan, okay? Well, you know, is, is, if, it, if it's make a difference in terms of the cumulative, uh, true or false, and maybe one of the exercises, you know, will shed light uh, on, on, on. Also, I'll, I'll pose that question to, uh, uh, to, to Matt, to in the business science, you know, cool. to see you know, which, which, one, uh, which one is the one that, you know, maybe he has some insights. In terms of you know uh, cross validation as a cumulative, you know uh, uh, fold or as a, as a constant uh, fold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, I also if you're if you're still taking new questions for him, <laughs> um, right? The uh, I would be interested if he's implemented something like this where you use bootstraps to estimate prediction intervals. Mm -hmm. um, that would be. That would be really interesting to me too if there was a way to do that easily in um okay in model sure. in model time um let me just i'm just gonna do a quick it's not in the api uh, by the way i post in the chat that there's a there's a function called pool you can see it right there pool model time residuals mm -hmm. uh it's a little bit down there yeah uh, so, okay, so yeah. you can do statistical tests to to boost. Okay, plot model right. time residuals. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So uh, this I'm has ACF function somewhere. Yeah. Oh yeah, ACF plot seasonality. Okay, so so it seems like a lot of the same. So this is this mm -hmm. is that first plot that uh, was in GG TS TS residuals. Correct. Um, and it seems like it's actually it might be the same. There's a seasonality plot that might be slightly different, but ACF is there. Time was the first one. And then, I mean, you could easily make a histogram if you want with all right. your own, but um, cool. Yeah, that's awesome that it's here. I didn't see that. Yeah, uh, so so that, that that's taken care of. But uh, at least the, the question on the on the, the cross-validation, you know, uh, difference between cumulative or not, and mm -hmm. then the bootstrapping, good. Yeah, boot and specifically for prediction intervals. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Let me see if Google has anything. Yeah, boot is our yeah, book here. That's back to the that's back to the text. And this here. is this is 2016, so it's stacked really yeah. low. Um yeah, it'd be really cool if like, you know, because like here in in Fable, you can just literally just say generate. And correct, you know, it's going to generate a bunch of possible paths based on that 
residual sampling process I was talking about. I mean, one thing that I was think I was like thinking about um, with this this method that I didn't understand at first, but I think I get it now at least a little bit better is like your so here you're in this procedure, right? You're always forecasting one step ahead, um, and then and then they said in the he said in the book like you can use this to estimate the prediction interval at any horizon and you can see that right like if you do a bunch of these different paths like you can say 10 steps 20 steps like across these simulated paths or simulated forecasts um but I, what i was curious about is like you always like see that as far the further you go into the future the wider in most cases except for the mean method your um your prediction interval is going to be right because like as you go in further and further right. in the future there's going to be more uncertainty um right. but and it actually seems like it doesn't does end up looking like that here um and i was wondering like if you're only going one step in the future how does it get there but i think the reason is it's because each each time each step you're sampling from the residual so like um with more steps it's more possible to end up further away from that point estimate than Correct. because like you're incorporating error or like a new this noise at every single step um so it kind of can add up and you can get you you'll tend to get wider intervals with further in time i think so that, i don't know that's how i was reasoning about it but mm -hmm. um but it was confusing that part is confusing me because i was like how how are you saying you can get a, a 10 step prediction interval you know if you're if you're doing a one step prediction each time but yeah i think it's because you each each step you're incorporating more and more of this sampling variance or like noise and then it like ends up leading to a similar uh result in terms of kind of your prediction interval growing uh, as you get further out into the future but mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I feel like I, after seeing this, I just want to use I want to use bootstrap prediction intervals for time series stuff every time. Um, mm -hmm. Like I guess I guess in the, the cases of mean naive, naive seasonal naive and drift, like it'll um, you know like it's you can directly estimate it. So I guess it's kind of computationally like you don't need to do it. But um, but in most cases, like yeah. I, it seems like a really interpretable and um, um, you know, it's nice that it's consistent across. It sounds like every kind of type of forecasting model. So, okay. Yeah, um, last thing is I, I think there was actually a really interesting, I saw this talk at our studio con. Um, I was just streaming it on, online. Um, and uh, this is like a bootstrap package for tidy models. Mm -hmm. um, uh, trying to find where I forget what the talk was called. I guess there's some some yeah ability to do that. Oh yeah, in tidy models already. But there was a really interesting talk on it um, in our studio comp. Anyway, if I find it, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think I I I got a glimpse of it. You know, because there, there, there were so many at the same time. <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah, but there, there, there was one that was, uh, it's, it's a new package. Yeah, it's still in, in development. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, oh, man. Yeah. Um, there, yeah, there's one. Let's see if I can just easily find it here. It's, it's going to make me search hard for this. Um, yeah, it was sometime in the afternoon at one point. Um, oh, these are all workshops. And... Yeah, but I, I, got, I got a glimpse, you know. I didn't see the whole, the, the whole uh, presentation, but yeah. Uh, and it was interesting. In fact, I, I think I, I downloaded it, you know, just to. Oh, here we go. Have, this one. Have, have, a, have, have, have an insight on that, yeah. This is what work Yeah, that's the word. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Oh man, I clicked the wrong thing. Doesn't like that. Oh, here we go. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is yeah. So this is this is exactly the kind of same problem, right? Like you have a model like XG Boost. How do you get a prediction interval out of it? Um, mm -hmm. And one way of doing that is yeah, bootstrap or sampling. So I guess I need to look at what tidy models offers already and how this adds to it, but it seemed like it add is it was adding something. Um, but you said this isn't released yet. This isn't on CRAN. Uh, yeah, it's, it's still in development. You know, uh, because I I I saw it in the middle, you know, to the end, and he said that you know it's still you know in the works. <laughs> oh, okay, well this says this one's on CRAN. It looks like maybe maybe it's an earlier version. Generate exactly, bootstrap. But it's, it's still in development because you know it's zero point two, right? Oh, I see. It's not like a stable. 0.2. It's not the you know the the the, the one point oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be really cool if like you could do something like this, and then also it would work or adjust in the proper way for um for time mm -hmm. series. But it's oh, a yeah. it's a different kind of logic. But uh, but if based on the class, yeah. Anyway, um, all right, we're already 10, 15 minutes over. But um, thank you. I enjoyed our discussion today. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I'll try to attend in the future as well. I just was saying to Mikhail today that uh, I'm coming up on like a very busy period for me. So um, uh, yeah, I'll do my best to attend, but it might be, it might be hard for me. Uh, I'm starting a certificate program in a few weeks and I have to do some things before I start that. So um, yeah, I'll see what I can do, but uh, it might be harder for me to present sure. and, you know, going into the future, but um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, so uh, do we want to discuss some of the exercises next next time? Yeah, uh, for this chapter, for five? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you know, it's, it's good to, you know, discuss the theory, but when you do the exercises, then you start, you know, seeing, you know, what are the, some of the, some of the obstacles that you will mm -hmm. find in the implementation. I, I, I found a couple of ones, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So maybe we could, we could do that. What, what do you think, Mikhail? Yeah, sure, we can do that. Okay, so. Uh, and we are gonna could skip. You, skip could, you, could, you give, could you give us a hint later, you know, in the Slack channel of, you know, which exercises do you think, you know, we should focus on? Um, or, or, or maybe we can, you know, well, it's gone already. <laughs> well, we can pick um, favorite ones and then do them all together. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Right also, Kevin, uh, in the in the chapter number four, there was an exercise that I, you know, didn't do because it it, it concerns uh, it talks about outliers, and I wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, have your your input mm -hmm. because I know that you have work, you know, uh, you know, in, in the in the in the in the real job. Uh, you know, detecting anomalies and all that. Mm -hmm. So if you can check that exercise, it's the last one in chapter uh, three. Oh, I see. Use a feature-based approach to look for outlying series. Exactly. Um, but also, you know, if, if, if you think mm -hmm. that there's another method, you know, alternate method, then, you know, uh, please, please bring mm -hmm. it, you know, also. Mm -hmm. because yeah. I, I know that you talk about the anomaly uh, package. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, uh, not, well, uh, so uh, anomalize, um, yeah, so anomalize is Matt's package, uh, and uh, okay. it's for time series, and but it's it's just really looking at like uh, individual points. Um, so like if, okay. if a point is an anomaly, which is really useful, but I think for this one, you so he's saying a feature based approach. So you want to like right take each time series, extract a feature, so you get one row per time series, and then you want to have some kind of multi dimensional outlier detection or anomaly detection approach where you're considering all those features where you have one row for each time series and trying to find the ones that are most anomalous but that's actually anomalous. exactly yeah. i'm the doing time series yeah exactly that's what i'm doing uh with um uh i'm doing that at work with like an isolation forest um okay so literally the same thing i'm using the feast the feast um uh uh like uh feature uh set and i'm do doing a subset of that and then and then using an isolation forest um, on top of that to right. uh, figure out out of the different series which ones are the, the most odd. Um, but I could I could do a like walk through that and just show yeah um, yeah please an example of that okay. yeah 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 because I said oh I, I remember Kevin you know talk about the you know, anomalies and he kind of mm -hmm. you know 
have more mm -hmm. experience in like that area. <laughs> yeah. But by the way, anomalize really works well for like point anomalies. Um, point anomalies. Yeah. Within the time yeah. series. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's, it's, uh, okay. it. it's really great. Um, but I think it uses, it uses from what I read, um, this STL decomposition. And I think well, after mm -hmm. you decompose it, you can just look at the, the remainder and then, and then use right. like, I bet it's just doing some kind of a, some approach based on, um, you know, like two standard deviations away from the mean or Correct. something like that. But what well, after you, once you're there, you just have this kind of like white noise data basically. Um, so, but it, it works really well. I, I've, I've been really happy with that, with that, that package. Um, so yeah, Matt's, Matt's some, some good stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll post those uh, questions. You know, the one with the awesome. cross validation and the, the bootstrapping. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, sounds good. And I'll and I'll try to do the pull request to the to the notes today, okay. tonight, or some sometime soon, and um, to get them up on the in the shared notes site. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate the discussion today. All right. Well, I think that's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Take care, guys. Bye. <laughs>